Well, hi everyone. This isn't a mere update video about the Washington Bridge demolition in Rhode Island. I'm also gonna cover the basic aspects of performing pre-construction surveys relative to concerns about construction-induced vibration, how you go about ensuring that you have set up the proper monitoring as well as establishment of uh, appropriate thresholds for vibration and noise. And uh, this is really a hot topic right now. I had a resident of Fox Point reach out to me and is usually the case with the Rhode Island DOT. There's been a general lack of transparency, uh, poor communication to the people in the area about what's actually going on. So I'm gonna go through what Rhode Island DOT says they're doing and compare that to uh, other construction vibration projects that I've been on. I've been on many, many of them over the years and they all have a lot of things in common, and I see key areas that may not be addressed at this time by Rhode Island DOT and their design build consultant doing this demolition. It's, it's just not clear, but I'll take you through it. This footage, I'm recording this video on Friday, February 28th, and Josh from Providence was kind enough again to do this drone flight for me. Now, as has been the case, I think, with all the drone footage that's been sent to me, Trucks are traversing in various lanes besides the designated right lane. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any enforcement on that issue. So as I mentioned, the Fox Hill neighborhood, it's immediately to the northwest of the former westbound Washington Bridge. So they had a front row seat to the demolition of the Gano Street exit ramp. I recently did a video called Shake, Rattle, and Roll where I expressed my concerns about whether or not Rhode Island DOT is actually monitoring the eastbound bridge for vibrations, as well as if they're keeping an eye on any potential impacts from vibration from the nearby demo, as it may impact the eastbound bridge. And uh, I've got an APRA request, I've had it out for several weeks, asking what they've done in terms of establishing threshold values for vibration and what their monitoring results have indicated and uh, that's still outstanding. So I'll provide an update when that APRA request is fulfilled. So whenever you're interested in monitoring the potential impacts to important nearby properties or structures from construction-induced vibrations or from demolition-induced vibrations, there's really three key steps. And the first one is to develop a monitoring plan. The monitoring plan includes a determination of allowable noise and vibration levels within a specified distance from the bridge, in this case, and that distance is usually 300 feet. I just came across this on the internet. I've done my own, uh, certainly many times in the past, but you produce this document, and part of this monitoring plan is to come up with threshold limits. You could set a limit for your instrumentation to say, hey, give me alert if it exceeds, if vibrations exceed this level, and, uh, then we're going to shut the thing down if it goes above the allowable limit. So the threshold limit, this is peak particle velocity in inches per second. So you can see in their categories, they go from either 0.38 inches per second to 0.09 inches per second. Most construction-induced vibrations and vibrations induced from demolition activity tend to be under a frequency of 30 hertz. And those tend to be the most damaging types of vibrations. You can have much higher allowable peak particle velocities with higher frequencies, say, from a, a blast that generates a shock wave in the ground. Those tend to be much higher uh, peak particle velocities, generally over an inch per second, but the frequency is such that it's not considered damaging. The frequency is much higher than what you have with construction activity. The next step is to perform pre and post construction condition surveys. And we've done this a number of times. So I, I've recently did a bridge project where we had to identify all the buildings within a 300 foot distance from construction induced vibrations. We had to send letters to the property owners, the businesses, homeowners to say, hey, this work's coming up. We'd like to access your property to do these condition surveys. And what you do is you document uh, through notes, photos, videos, the condition of visible surfaces on the interior and exterior. For example, basement floor slabs, foundation walls, 
uh, the exterior of the building. You're looking for any cracks, any distortion, any uh, distress to the building. And certainly if that's, if that's pre-existing, you want to clearly document that. The other part is to help you identify, well, maybe these structures are more sensitive to vibrations than we may have thought. So it helps you uh, adjust your allowable limits for vibration if necessary. So I'm going to go to the third step here in a moment, but this came from a meeting, a virtual meeting that RIDOT held. I think the governor was on that call as well on October 17th, 2024. And they're answering a variety of questions posed by members of the media, as well as uh, from the public. They talk about how will you monitor the dust in the air and towards the bottom here, how will you monitor vibrations during the demolition? The answer is vibration is being monitored during demolition with sensors in and around the neighborhood. All vibration levels have been within the industry standard limits for demolition. They go on to say RIDOT conducted pre-construction inspections on many of the structures close to the construction. RIDOT will also perform those same kinds of inspections after construction to make sure that the construction activity did not result in any damage to nearby properties. So as part of these condition surveys, you can install what are called crack monitors to more accurately determine if there's movement going on during the course of your construction or demolition activity. And then step three is to actually set up the monitors. And the monitors I use, they have a microphone so you can monitor air blast. And then they also have an accelerometer to monitor the actual ground acceleration from these construction or demolition activities. So we'll typically set these monitors up at the closest structure to the vibrations that are generated by these construction or demolition activities. And then if that activity location changes throughout the course of the project, we'll move the instrument or oftentimes we'll deploy multiple uh, uh, instruments. And this is what one of these looks like. This is the computer end of things where you plug your sensors in and you can connect a modem to get instant alerts if the threshold's been reached. This is what the uh, accelerometer looks like. You're using it to monitor ground vibration in three principal axes. And these have spikes so you can push them into the ground. If you have a hard surface, you take the spikes off and you put a sandbag on the top. And it's got an arrow on the top. That's your principal direction. You want to point that towards the direction of the activity that's generating the vibrations. And this is what one of these plots look like. This is from pile driving near a sensitive railroad. And we monitored both the pile driving and the vibrations for this project. And as I mentioned, we have these set up with modems. If you're leaving them at the project location for an extended period of time, you put them in these steel lock boxes for security reasons. Then of course you have to have a battery to run everything and you'll have a solar panel typically to recharge that battery. Otherwise, you gotta go out there every week or two and swap batteries out. Then you have an antenna that transmits the signal from the cellular modem so that you can set it up to get an email when a threshold level has been reached. Now, I obtained from a previous APRA request the proposal from the joint venture team that was ultimately selected to do the demolition of the superstructure, and then they got a change order to include the demolition of the substructure, but this is Etna, Vinagro, Jacobs, and you can see here they're listing preliminary risks associated with the project. And item five, the following items represent potential risk with regard to geotechnical aspects of the project. A, movement of existing substructures. B, damage to existing structures, utilities, and storm drains due to construction vibrations or loads. And it's the responsibility of the design build team. And typically the design build team would be required to submit what they're doing to the DOT, which would seem reasonable here. It indicates their mitigation strategy is the team will develop a monitoring program in conjunction with the pre and post bridge survey to ensure the zero inch criteria is met. Jacobs geotechnical engineers will be consulted to review the existing foundations, subsurface information, and advise on restrictions to the proposed demolition plans. So again, that's indicative of being part of an overall monitoring plan for vibrations. And some other items of discussion from this question and answer session back in October, how will you mitigate the noise caused by the demolition? 
The answer is noise mitigation is difficult. Knocking down a massive concrete structure takes heavy equipment and high impact in order to break it apart. The good news is that the worst is over. We have only three more nights of jackhammering related noise left. Sunday through Tuesday, October 20th to 22nd. Another question, and I'm going to come back to that point as well. As a result, directly next to the construction site, what is being done to mediate the harmful dust as well as the impact of the jarring shaking has had on our whole structures? Uh, the answer to that is the vibration is being monitored. We have a number of vibration sensors that we have deployed through the neighborhood to make sure that the vibrations are at or below the regulatory standards. So far, they have been. We also took a survey of the buildings in the area to determine their condition prior to the beginning of the demolition project. At the end of the project, we'll be sending the same inspectors out to take a look at those same buildings to make sure there is no change in each of the buildings that are nearby that may have been impacted by any vibrations. And in those cases, we'll be taking a building by building inventory of that and we'll be interacting with the owners of those properties to make sure that either no damage has been done or if there has been damage that it's remediated. Well, we already know that their demolition plan hasn't gone according to plan, despite what Director Alviti has stated as a, as a result of his appearances on uh, radio, WPRO. I obtained through a confidential source an excerpt from the demolition plan. They were supposed to go in an orderly sequence with the final step breaking these uh, girders, these fascia girders in the middle and allowing them to drop onto these blast pads that were on the deck of this barge. And then they could break up those two separate pieces uh, over time. And instead, this is what you had happen. So that fell down all at once, obviously, and it was at night, and it created quite a shock to the people in the neighborhood. Now, as dramatic as that is, I would be more concerned about the vibrations and noise from demolition of the substructure. That has the potential since the existing substructure for both bridges is pile supported. So you could possibly have vibrations that are transmitted from the pier columns, and then later when they're demoing the actual piles to be readily transmitted to uh, the nearby eastbound bridge in particular, as well as uh, other buildings in the vicinity. But as I mentioned, the APRA request has not been fulfilled where I asked for the vibration monitoring plan, as well as the results of the vibration monitoring that's supposedly been done to date. I think uh, it's quite interesting that people who live in that neighborhood, uh, according to their uh, emails to me, have no idea what's going on with this, this monitoring that's supposed to be going on. And then one of the last questions I'm gonna cover here from that QA session, will this air and vibration sensor data be posted anywhere publicly during the duration of the work? The answer is yes, we're using the WashingtonBridge.com website as a place that people can go and look at the data along with any other data that we have relative to the site. Okay, well, I checked this site periodically. I checked it today as the recording of this video and they've got some information about nighttime noise and they've got some information about dust. That's it. I couldn't find anything about the results of vibration monitoring for this demolition activity. I couldn't find any information about what their monitoring plan was, what the safe determined levels were for vibration limits. So I can understand the confusion by people in the, in the area. I mean, if RIDOT is going to be transparent, they need to do what they say they're gonna do and actually post this information publicly rather than say, hey, we've got it handled. Because again, if you look at that demolition where things aren't going according to plan, uh, it doesn't engender confidence in the statements made by the Rhode Island DOT uh, director in particular. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. I've got a number of instances where uh, I can document where Director Alvedi said one thing and it clearly wasn't true. And then in some cases he comes back and says something completely different to, to try and clean up these statements. And I find many of his statements to be wholly unreliable relative to the Washington Bridge. They also have this monthly snapshot report that they post to their website. And the February 1 report 
had no information that I could find on vibration monitoring or allowable vibration limits. So this is uh, a webcam of the Washington Bridge traffic from today, February 28th. You can see off to the right, that's what's left after the completion of the superstructure demo. So they've got the pier columns ready to be demoed. So I'll continue to follow this story. I wanted to tie in not only the Washington Bridge, but also give you an overview of how these vibration studies are done. Again, you start out with a monitoring plan. You determine safe or permissible vibration limits. You do pre and post construction surveys in most cases to document the condition of these structures. You know, sometimes it's not even required, but contractors will retain my firm to do this work as a deterrent for people to make false claims potentially. And it's not always done out of, uh, you know, deliberate sense to try and defraud somebody. Sometimes people don't really pay attention to their structures until they start feeling vibrations from some nearby construction source. And I've seen that a number of times where people start scrutinizing things and they see cracks that have been there for years, but they're seeing them for the first time and they think, oh, it's come from the nearby construction or demolition activity. So that's why it's so important to, to document what's going on, but also to help you monitor because if there is a change, it allows you to make adjustments into your procedures for construction or demolition so that you don't make things worse. So I hope everyone enjoyed that overview as well as the specifics about the Washington Bridge. If uh, you like this kind of content, please consider contributing to buy me a coffee. I wanna thank those of you who have contributed and there's been a, quite a number of you. That's a great way to support the channel. I also wanna thank the channel members. I've had channel members in many cases for over a year now and the ranks are growing. And then finally, I'd like to thank those of you who have contributed to Super Thanks. Thanks very much everyone and please stay tuned for future videos.